welcome to Oracle Developer Live and our session on keeping your Java application secure, cryptographic improvements and best practices. My name is Sean Mullen. Um, Chris Rees will be another speaker. He will be joining us later for the latter half of the session. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about futures today. So I'm going to put the safe harbor statement up as required. Please take a couple of moments to read through this. So a little bit about the speakers today. My name is Sean Mullen. I'm the technical lead of the Java Security Libraries team at Oracle. And I'm also the Open JDK Security Group lead. Uh, on my Twitter handle is Sean J. Mullen. I mostly tweet about Java security technology. So it's a good way to stay up to date with what's happening in Java security. Chris is a member of the Java vulnerability team at Oracle, focusing on software security. And he's also the primary maintainer of the secure coding guidelines for Java SE. So our agenda for today's talk, I'll first start off with the goals and what you should expect to learn today. I'll then give a very high level overview of Java SE and JDK security. This should be helpful for those of you that are not that familiar with Java security. And for the rest of you, hopefully be a nice refresher. I'll then go into the various cryptographic improvements that we have been making to Java and the JDK. And I'll explain how they help keep your application secure. Chris will then take over and talk about secure programming best practices. And we'll have a Q&A session at the end for about 10 minutes. Uh, while we go along, you can, you can ask questions in the Q&A icon at the below at the bottom of your Zoom window. So we have two primary goals for our session today. The first, we want you to understand how the cryptographic improvements that we've made to Java, the Java SE platform and JDK, help your applications better withstand various threats. And two, we want you to discover best practices and guidelines for programming securely in Java. So first, an overview of Java SE and JDK security. The Java SE platform consists of a large set of security APIs covering a broad range of security functionality. There are APIs for cryptographic primitives, also called JCA or JCE. And these include things like message digests, digital signatures, ciphers, and so forth. We also have several APIs related to network security. We have JSSE, which is our APIs for transport layer security, GSS API, and SASL. We have an authentication API called JAZZ, which allows you to plug in different login mechanisms. And there's also an optional component called the Security Manager, which acts as a central authority for granting permissions to code. Now, most of these APIs are based on a service provider architecture, which means that third-party implementations can be plugged in, different, uh, implementing different algorithms of those APIs. But the JDK itself supports several different service providers by default, which, which support many standard algorithms. And finally, there's a couple of tools. We, we have jar signer for signing and verifying jar files and key tool for managing key stores, keys, certificates, and so forth. So in the next, next section, I'm going to talk specifically about cryptographic improvements. I'll discuss the motivation for the improvements, how they help improve security, and various highlights of the improvements that we have made recently. So first, the motivation. I'm going to bet that a lot of you listening today work on security technology. And you probably know that the cryptographic landscape evolves at a very fast pace. Uh, most, if not all, crypto algorithms weaken over time. And once they start showing cracks, uh, users and developers are advised to move away from those algorithms. But thankfully, stronger and more modern algorithms are constantly being developed and standardized and then replacing those older, weaker ones. However, the lifetime of a JDK release can outlast the viable lifetime of many crypto algorithms. As an example, JDK 7 was released in 2011, 
but is still supported by Oracle today. But many of the algorithms in 2011 that were considered secure are no longer recommended today. So therefore, we must continuously make improvements. I call this ongoing process of improvements making the JDK secure. And the improvements generally fall into one of four different categories, which are shown in this diagram. The four categories are strong algorithms, strong defaults, restrictions, and warning and events. Um, in the next few slides, I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail and give you examples of each. So the first category is strong algorithms. This is ensuring that the JDK has a set of strong cryptographic algorithms and protocols that allow you to continue to build modern, secure Java applications. In order to achieve this goal, we must continuously add new and stronger algorithms to JDK. And here's a list of what we've been adding recently. In JDK 9, we added support for SHA-3. SHA-3 is the next generation hash algorithm, and it's designed to be as strong as SHA-2. JDK 11, we added support for several algorithms. RSA, SSA, PSS is a, is a more secure variant of the RSA digital signature algorithm and it's also mandatory in TLS 1.3. We also backported that to JDK 8U 2.51. ChaCha 20 is a modern streamed cipher and together with Poly 1.305, it provides an authenticated stream cipher. X25519 and X448 are modern elliptic curve key agreement algorithms that are more efficient and secure than the existing elliptic curve to fee Hellman scheme. JDK 11, we also added support for TLS 1.3, which, which is the latest version of TLS and has many security and performance improvements. And we also backported that to JDK 8U 2.61. More recently in JDK 12, we added support in TLS for the ChaCha 20 and Poly 1.305 cipher suites. JDK 13, we added support for TLS for the X25519 and X4048 key agreement schemes. And in JDK 15, we are adding support for the Edwards curve digital signature algorithm, which is a new, uh, the latest modern uh, sig digital signature algorithm. It's based on elliptic curve cryptography and it has many security advantages. So as you can see, we're constantly adding new and strong algorithms, allowing you to create the latest and greatest uh, secure applications that meet today's uh, needs. The next category is strong defaults. So some of the security APIs, tools, and implementations use defaults, default algorithms, default key sizes, when specific values are not specified. So this is ensuring that when you install the JDK, those APIs, tools, and implementations use strong defaults and that we adjust these over time. And here are just a few examples. The algorithm parameter generator and key pair generator APIs generate 2048-bit DSA and RSA keys and 256-bit EC keys when the size is not specified. For TLS 1.2, TLS under ECDHE, under ECDSA with AES 256 GCM SHA384. That's quite a mouthful, but that is the highest priority cipher suite and offers a really strong security. So that will be the, the suite that will be negotiated first. Key tool and jar signer both use SHA2 for digest and signature algorithms by default, and key tool generates 2048-bit DSA and RSA keys and 256-bit EC keys by default. So we monitor these over time and we will upgrade those to stronger algorithms as necessary. The next category is restrictions. So this is ensuring that when you install the JDK, weak algorithms and protocols are disabled or restricted by default. Now these restrictions are enforced in higher level components such as TLS and signed jars but not directly in JCE or the crypto layer. So if you want to use MD5 directly, you still can, but it's up to you to know if it is safe to use for your particular needs. 
However, we will protect you from using MD5 in higher level components where you could use it unknowingly and, and not realize it. So the benefits of those restrictions are twofold. They prevent network security protocols from negotiating weak ciphers and algorithms, and they also block weak security artifacts transmitted over the network. So things like certificates, CRLs, OCSP responses, sign jars, and XML signatures. Um, these are some of the defaults that, that you get when you install the JDK, not a complete list. For certificate path validation, MD2 and MD5 are restricted. Any certificates signed with RSA DSA keys less than 1024 bits are restricted, or EC keys less than 224 bits. Also, public SHA-1 TLS certificates are restricted by default. And these are certificates that chain back to uh, one of the root CAs that are included in the JDK. For TLS, SSL v3, which is widely known as insecure, is, is restricted by default. And any cipher suites that use RC4, DES, or triple DES algorithms. And all of the cert path restrictions also apply to TLS. For signed jars, MD2 and MD5 are restricted, and any jars signed with RSA or DSA keys less than 1,024 bits. The final category I want to talk about today is warnings and events. So these warnings and events are intended to alert you and help you diagnose when weak algorithms are being used in your security artifacts or applications. Key tool has been enhanced to emit warnings when weak algorithms are being used. There's two examples here I want to show you. The first is we're generating a um, self-signed certificate and a key pair and using the signature algorithm MD5 with RSA. It does generate the key pair and certificate, but at the end it, it, it emits a warning telling it that the, the MD5 with RSA signature algorithm is considered a security risk. Second example is similar, but in this case, we're generating a RSA key pair of 512 bits, which is known to be very weak. And again, key tool gener generates a, a warning at the end saying that the 512 bit RSA key is considered a security risk. The jar signer tool has similar warnings. If you try to sign a jar, uh, we're using here with using a, a signature algorithm of MD5 with RSA, Jar signer will sign the jar, but it will print out a warning saying that that algorithm is considered a security risk. If you then try to verify that signed jar, it will emit a warning saying that it will be treated as unsigned because it is signed with a weak algorithm that is now disabled. And then we've also in JDK 12, we've been, if anyone uses the Java Flight Recorder, which is a great tool, we've added new security events that allow you to monitor uh, security information in your applications. So four new events have been added, uh, one that records security property events, one that records TLS handshake events, and then two that record X509 certificate related events. And here's a screenshot of flight using Flight Recorder and it's recording TLS information. It shows you the Cypher suite and various other information. So this is a good way to zero in on what's happening in your environment and see if any insecure or weak algorithms are being used. So my final slide is just a, a slide for more information. Many of the restrictions and algorithms that I talked about today um, are, are published on the Java Crypto Roadmap. And this provides you with information about upcoming changes to security policies and algorithms. So I highly recommend checking that out if you haven't seen it before and periodically looking at it. It also it provides you with instructions for testing if the changes might affect your applications before they take effect. So you can um, prepare for them in advance. And then most of the work we do is in the open, in the open JDK. So you can go to the security group and find out more about uh, what we do and, and if if you want to help, you can also find out ways to get involved. So now I'm going to hand it over to Chris, who's going to talk about secure programming best practices in Java. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about secure programming best practices. Um, next slide. And a big part of secure programming is eliminating and avoiding vulnerabilities. Now, what's a vulnerability? Well, one definition is a flaw or weakness that could be exploited to violate the system's security policy. Now, vulnerabilities can really be introduced throughout the development process. When the software is being designed, faulty assumptions could be made. For example, uh, part of the application might need to be protected by authentication and access control, but that's not identified during the design. Vulnerabilities can also be introduced during implementation. A couple examples of that, uh, SQL injection, where untrusted code is used to construct a database query, or cross-site scripting, where untrusted data is used to construct uh, HTML that's returned to the user. Uh, in that case, um, you, know, you can run into cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities, and there's a whole slew of other vulnerabilities that can be introduced during implementation. During composition and setup, configuration errors can lead to security issues. Uh, vulnerable third-party applications or third-party libraries could be bundled with the application, and that can introduce vulnerabilities into the application itself. And even after deployment or release, uh, third-party libraries might be up to date during release, but after release, uh, patches are released for them, and so they fall out of date over time. So the key takeaways here are that Vulnerabilities can really be introduced at any point during development, so security needs to be considered throughout development. And generally speaking, the earlier you detect the vulnerability, the lower the cost to fix it. So if a vulnerability is introduced during design, for example, uh, if it's identified during design, then it's relatively low cost to fix it. If it's not identified until after release, then the design needs to be updated it needs to be re-implemented and the code needs to be re-released. And so that really increases the cost of fixing the vulnerability. Next slide. So uh, secure coding um, really starts with training and that's something that we're gonna look at more um, later in the presentation. Beyond that, during the design, there should be security reviews of the design. There's several different approaches you can take to that. One example is threat modeling. Uh, where you essentially try to enumerate the threats that an application might face, and then uh, uh, you can prioritize them, and you can make sure that you have the correct mechanisms to protect against them. Uh, another example of that is attack trees. During implementation and testing, you can have manual code reviews. Uh, you can use static analysis tools, such as source code scanners. Many of these can integrate with the IDE, which allows to, uh, the developers to identify the vulnerability as early as possible, um, which really reduces the cost of fixing them. And another example of a static analysis tool is a dependency checker that will go through those third-party libraries and make sure that none of them are missing security patches. During runtime testing, uh, you can use web application security scanners if you're developing a web app or web service. Uh, depending on the type of application being developed, you might be able to use a fuzzer, which is a tool that uh, uses one of several approaches to um, create input that's fed into the application with the intention of creating faults in the application. So either a crash or maybe uh, an unexpected exception being thrown or some other type of error condition. And then lastly, you have manual testing. Even after the code is deployed or released, you can have ongoing security tasks, such as vulnerability scanning or ongoing monitoring. Uh, one example of monitoring would be using a web application firewall to detect and potentially stop attacks. And not only that, but if you see attackers attacking your application, uh, you might identify vulnerabilities that way. It's possible that they found a vulnerability and they're trying to exploit it. The web app firewall might detect that exploitation attempt and then you can go back and find the vulnerability yourself and fix it in your code. Ongoing dependency patching has to occur after release or deployment as well. And lastly, there should be a vulnerability remediation process in place so that when a vulnerability is identified, whether it be through monitoring 
or through a uh, you know, third party notifying you about it, there's a process in place already to fix it so you're not sort of figuring it out on the fly. So the key takeaways here are that security needs to be considered throughout the development process. And this can really look different depending on what development process you're using. However, a lot of this can be automated so that even if you're using an agile approach with very short sprints, or something where you're uh, deploying code at a very fast pace, you can still integrate a lot of these activities into your development process uh, to account for security. Next slide. So these are some good secure coding resources and we'll start with the secure coding guidelines for Java SE. Now this is a document that is published and maintained by Oracle and we're gonna take a closer look at this next. Beyond that, Carnegie Mellon University's Software Engineering Institute has a Computer Emergency Response Team, or CERT, that publishes some very good secure coding resources. Uh, one example of that is the Secure Coding Standard for Java, which is available as both a printed book and an online wiki. Another example is the Java Coding Guidelines book that they published that has some good security guidance in it as well. And then there's top vulnerability lists that various groups publish. Uh, one example of that is the Open Web App Security Project's top 10. Uh, SANS has a top 20 list that's similar to that. And the goal of those lists really to uh, identify the top vulnerabilities seen in applications. And they're periodically updated as well so that they stay up to date. And then lastly, MITRE has the common weakness enumeration which assigns unique identifiers to each type of vulnerability and also shows vulnerable code examples in different languages and things like that. So by looking at these vulnerability lists, you can sort of get a feel for what the top types of vulnerabilities are seen in applications, understand uh, how they're exploited, what the impact is, and that can help you avoid them in your code. Next slide. So the Secure Coding Guidelines for Java SE, as I mentioned, is a document published and maintained by Oracle. And it's really meant to cover guidelines that are unique to Java or that are especially relevant for Java. So it's not intended to be a comprehensive uh, secure programming tutorial. There's already a lot of good resources for that. Um, for example, some of the CERT resources I just mentioned. It's more intended to cover how certain general secure coding practices apply to Java. As far as the organization of the document, um, you have earlier sections that are generally applicable regardless of the type of software um, that you're developing. Parts of the later sections are more focused on situations where you have code with different permission levels running or code that interacts with untrusted code. So just one example of that, Sean mentioned the security manager earlier. Section nine uh, is very focused on the security manager and how to use it safely. Uh, but parts of these later sections are still applicable for other situations. So as far as using the guidelines, it's good to go start to finish to sort of get a feel for what the content is. And then when you're writing code or when you're fixing vulnerabilities, you can go back and reference them uh, to, to get specific guidance on what you're doing. Now we periodically update the guidelines. We try to do one bigger update a year and we're actually planning on releasing that update in the next couple of weeks. Uh, beyond that, when we see a new vulnerability trend or when a new feature in Java is released that requires um, additional guidance, we'll update it with smaller updates at other points during the year. So we're not gonna look at all the guidelines in depth today, but we will take a closer look at a couple of the sections. Next slide. So the first section we're gonna look at is section three, which covers injection and inclusion. So this is where you're gonna see a lot of the common vulnerabilities that I was talking about earlier. For example, 3-2 covers SQL injection, 3-3 and 3-5 cover some of the more common XML vulnerabilities you'll see, such as XML entity expansion. And section three dash, or guideline 3-3 also covers HTML related issues like cross-site scripting. 3-8 is take care interpreting untrusted code. Uh, there's some situations where it's obvious that you're interpreting untrusted code. For example, if you, uh, if you take a script from an untrusted source and you use one of the scripting APIs 
um, to execute it, that's fairly obvious. But there's also a lot more subtle situations in Java where you may encounter untrusted code. Uh, for example, um, if you're using the LDAP APIs to communicate with an untrusted LDAP server. So this guideline covers those specific situations and it discusses how to avoid them or how to do them safely. So the key takeaways from this section are validate data from untrusted sources, prefer allow lists over block lists, which is something I'm gonna talk about in the next section more. And then lastly, use standard parsers. So if you have to process XML or HTML, uh, it's better to use a, a library or API with a well-established track record, as opposed to trying to reinvent the wheel and write your own parser. Uh, those types of parsers are very tricky to get right and it's very common for them to introduce vulnerabilities. So it's better to just use a standard, well-established parser or library instead. Next slide. So the next section we'll take a quick look at is serialization and deserialization. That's section eight. Now serial serialization is the process of taking an object from memory and converting it into a stream of bytes. And those bytes can then be saved to a file or a database or passed over the network. And deserialization is essentially the reverse of that. You take a stream of bytes and you reconstruct an object from it. Now deserialization of untrusted data is inherently dangerous and should be avoided. So that's emphasized on the bottom of this slide. It's also emphasized uh, very much in the early parts of this section. And then the subsequent guidelines cover situations where it can't be avoided. So for example, you might have a legacy application that for compatibility reasons can't be moved away from deserialization. Um, in that case, you wanna follow these guidelines to do it as safely as possible. And just one example of that is 8-6, which uh, covers using serialization filters to filter untrusted serial data. Now, serialization filters essentially allow you to restrict uh, what can be deserialized. Now, two common approaches to that are a block list approach and an allow list approach. With the block list approach, you basically say, do not deserialize objects of these specific classes, but deserialize any other class. Uh, that can be a good starting point. However, the downside is that um, it's, it's very hard to cover everything that you need to when you're specifically trying to block things. So if you try to block the classes that are used uh, in deserialization attacks, every time a new attack method is created, you're going to have to update your filter. And if there's an attack method that isn't publicly known, then you're probably not going to be protected against it. So for those reasons, it's preferred to use an allow list approach where you basically say only deserialize objects of these classes and don't deserialize anything else. That's obviously trickier to implement because you need to be able to specifically identify every single class that your application needs to deserialize. But from a security perspective, it's a much stronger approach. And serial filters can also be used to do things like limit array lengths and cycles within the objects being deserialized to help protect against denial service attacks. So the key takeaways here are deserialization of untrusted data is dangerous, so it should be avoided whenever possible. Um, if, if you can use an alternate representation, such as JSON or XML, um, that would be a preferred approach. You'll obviously wanna be aware of the pitfalls of, of that approach uh, or of any libraries that you're using that use that approach, but generally it's a safer option. When you can't avoid it, then you're gonna to wanna to follow the guidelines in this section to make sure you do it as safely as possible. So just to summarize, uh, security vulnerabilities can be introduced really at any point during the development cycle. So it's important to consider security throughout the development life cycle. And a lot of that starts um, upfront with good training. So I encourage you to check out the secure coding guidelines document online as well as some of the CERT documents and vulnerability lists that I referenced earlier. So at this point, uh, we'll use the remaining time to answer any questions that you have. Uh, feel free to post them in the Q&A section below.
Okay, so we have um, a question coming in and it is what algorithms or protocols are you planning to restrict in the new, near future? Okay, so I can answer that question. So as I said earlier, all the information about what algorithms or protocols we are gonna be restricting in the near future is published on the Java cryptographic roadmap. And again, the URL is http colon slash slash java.com slash crypto roadmap. Um, on that, if, if I, my memory serves me correctly, we, we do have a few restrictions coming up. One in October, we'll be restricting several elliptic curves that are either no longer recommended or considered weak by the industry. And there's much more information about the complete list of curves in the additional, additional information link of that um, section of the crypto roadmap. Also next April in, in next year, we are gonna be disabling signed jars, jars signed with SHA-1 algorithms. Uh, we will allow jars that have, were previously signed and timestamped before a certain date for now, uh, but anything that's signed after a certain date will be restricted and, and treated as unsigned. And then finally, sometime next year, we will also be disabling TLS 1.0 and 1.1. Both of those protocols are now considered uh, not recommended for usage anymore. And uh, we, we don't want to, to enable them by default anymore. Next question is, are the restrictions enforced in all current JDK releases? So I can also take that question. Yes, for the most part, unless there's some um, obscure reason, all the restrictions that we, we, we enforce are backported to all J JDK releases. So JDK 7, 8, 11, and uh, whatever the, the latest release that we support is. Um, sometimes maybe you know an older release doesn't support a specific algorithm or something like that. There may be an exception to that, but for the most part, the restrictions are, are, are consistent across all our supported releases. Uh, next question, what if my application uses a restricted algorithm but cannot be changed? Will it still work? Right, so I mean, there, there may be cases where you have an application, you maybe don't have the source code anymore and, and you, but you need to just get it to work and suddenly it doesn't work because it's using an older weak algorithm. Yes, there's usually a way out of that. Um, most of our restrictions are, are configurable through the java.security file and security properties. So at your own risk, you could go in there and, and, and re-enable one of the algorithms that are restricted by removing it from one of those properties. Um, or a better way is to use something like the, the java.security.property system property, um, which allows you to specify that this Java security file is only gonna be used by this application. So you limit it that, that risk to that one application and not every application that's using that, that, that JDK. Um, so yeah, there usually is a way out, but even if you, have, if you have control over the source code also, there's usually a way, an API that you can call or something like that, which allows you to specifically enable that, that weaker algorithm, again, at, at your own risk. Okay, the next question is, what are some good ways to introduce security into an existing development process? Um, and I would say, uh, you know, like I emphasized during the talk, start with training. There's some good uh, resources freely available that I referenced, so definitely check those out. Um, as far as integrating into the process, uh, you know, for design reviews, you can even start with something informal or you can look into some of the approaches like threat modeling. Uh, there's some good tooling available to help you guide you through the threat modeling process. Um, moving on to implementation and testing, there's also some, some free tools, some open source tools that you can try in the short term. Uh, OWASP, the, the Open Web App Security Project group that I mentioned earlier, they have a, a tool called Zap that can do some types of vulnerability scanning and fuzzing for web apps. They also have a dependency checker uh, where you can check for missing patches and third-party dependencies. And then longer term, you can start to evaluate some of the commercial tools available for static and dynamic analysis. 
Uh, there's also some tools available uh, depending on what environment you're in. For example, um, if, you're, if you're using Oracle Cloud, there's some Java vulnerability scanning capabilities there already. Um, but I would basically say, you know, look at it as part of the process. Don't just look at it as a product or tool that you're going to add security onto at the end and, you know, set up some short-term and long-term things that you can do for each step of the development process. So the next question is, can you talk more about the updates in the next secure coding guidelines for Java SE release? Yeah, so I mentioned that we're getting another uh, update ready in the next couple of weeks. Um, so typically with these updates, we'll go through, we'll look at the method lists, the code examples, we'll see if anything's been deprecated and things like that, um, and we'll label them or update the code example. Um, so that's one thing we're gonna be doing. We're also adding more guidance as far as third-party libraries and other code goes. So I talked a lot about third-party dependencies being a source for vulnerabilities. So we're adding some general guidance for that as well as some more specific guidance uh, throughout the sections of the guidelines. Um, a couple more examples, we're adding some more uh, information about safe exception handling for servers and services to help avoid denial service issues. And I talked about 3-8, the uh, take care interpreting untrusted code. We're also expanding upon that a bit more to cover uh, more cases. So I think that's the end of the questions. And we'll just show the next slide. Okay, so up next we have this Ain't Your Parents Java uh, by Venkat and then the path towards Spring Boot native applications on Graal VM by Sebastian and Andy. Uh, you can visit the uh, uh, website for the event agenda. And from there, you can click the join button on the agenda to join either one of these upcoming sessions.